between all of the default brushes in Corel Painter, all the brushes that I've created, all the brushes that you can create, all the brushes that you can import from Photoshop, there are almost more brushes than you could ever use in your lifetime. Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but there are a lot of brushes. I can imagine for a first time user of Corel Painter that can be very intimidating, and you might feel like you don't even know where to start, which brushes should you use, and a lot of that will come to you through experimentation. But I do have some suggestions of brushes that I find useful that I use all the time in my workflow, and I would consider these to be my essential brushes. Now some of these will be specific brushes, and some of these will be specific types of brushes. All of these brushes are located in my custom palettes because I use them so often. We have looked at a few of these earlier, but we'll talk a little bit more about them. Let's start with the airbrushes and we'll choose Digital Airbrush AR. I'm gonna go ahead and reset this one. I use them a lot for adding form to objects or creating gradients or transitions in color. They're very, very useful brushes. And then we have Grainy Glazing Airbrush, which is the same brush, but you can use glazing and it has some grain. So if I change my paper grain to something more extreme and I increase the opacity of this brush, then you can see it's an airbrush, but it has a nice graininess to it. If I switch to the Digital Airbrush G2, I can change the merge mode to let's say multiply, and then I can gradually build up this nice darker and darker color without having to change the color here, or I could change it to screen, and I could make it lighter and lighter and build it up without having to change the color. So it's basically an airbrush that can use the merge modes and glaze. And then the regular digital airbrush does not have any of those fancy green or glazing features. It's just a regular soft airbrush. Next is the smooth scratch board. The smooth scratch board I use most often for inking. If I'm drawing nice ink outlines for something, it's great for that. It also works well if I create a separate layer and I fill it with a color to create a nice silhouette of an object. And then I'll often use that along with the airbrushes to then shade that object using something like the airbrush. If I wanted something that looks a little bit more like a pencil, I could use the detail oils brush. And I know this says it's an oils brush, but you don't have to use it with oil paint. It can just be a nice thin brush that looks kind of like a pencil. The edge on this is a bit softer compared to the scratch board tool, which has a much sharper, more opaque edge. So whichever one you would choose depends on the kind of look that you want. The smooth scratch board also has some damping applied to it to make it more stable, whereas the detail oils does not. That way you can sketch more quickly and loosely with it. And then beneath that is the sketching pencil. And this is a pencil, but it has a little bit of grain to it. So it's not a perfect line. You can also angle your pen and kind of shade with the side of it as well. I'm gonna go ahead and change my paper grain to something else. Let's say small dots. Now when we draw with this and we shade with it, you can see that small dots pattern, which actually isn't all that small. We need to make it a bit smaller. Now you'll really be able to see more of that grain in the strokes. It looks a lot more like a grainy pencil on paper. We've already played around with a glow brush quite a bit. I use the glow brush a lot in my paintings. The jitter airbrush is just an airbrush that's a bit jittery. I might use that for clouds and fog. Next to that, we have glazing chalk. And the glazing chalk, the random chalk, and the dab chalk erase are all kind of grouped together in this column because they're all kind of textured chalky brushes. Glazing chalk, I use a lot for adding texture to things. This works in tandem with your paper texture here. So you can get a lot of different looks by changing your paper texture. Now if we look in grain, this is using random grain rotation. So it is giving us a little bit of randomization when we build up the strokes. This helps it look a lot more realistic and helps the pattern not look so repetitive and unnatural. But if we wanted it to be a little bit more random, we could choose a random chalk. And now that's added both the grain rotation and random grain position. So now when we do a stroke, we're getting something that's a lot more random. And so I might use this for something like creating trees or bushes, whereas I might use the other one, the glazing chalk, just for adding texture on top of something if I wanted to create a rocky texture. And I might select simulated wood grain and build it up like this. Now because glazing chalk is also a glazing brush, I can change the merge mode to multiply. And then I can use that to add some shadows on this tree here without having to change my color. Or I could change it to screen. And I could use that same color to add highlights, brighter leaves on this side. So it's a very versatile brush. And then beneath that, at the bottom of this column, we have dab chalk eraser. This is an eraser that's going to be using the dab stencil as the pattern. 
So if we look in Dab Stencil and Texture, Apply Dab Stencil is turned on, it's set to Flow Map, and it's currently set to the fine dots. If we set that to Clouds, then we're erasing like this. So that might actually work better here. We can punch some little holes in between the leaves on this tree. Or we can chip away at the edges of the tree, like so. Next to that, in this column, we have the Sponge G, the Pepper Spray, and the Pixel Spray. These are brushes that make fine little details and textures. Let's start with Sponge G. I'm going to set the opacity up to 72%. Let's do a test stroke, and you can see we get this nice spongy texture. If we make our brush bigger, and that texture is bigger. If we make it smaller, then it's smaller. I use this brush a lot to add textures to things. It works good if you double it up with the glazing chalk here, and you can build these textures up upon themselves to give you even more realistic looking results. I'm going to go back to the sponge. The sponge is also a glazing brush, so again, I can take advantage of the merge mode here to build up the colors lighter or darker upon themselves. We have the pepper spray beneath that, which we looked at earlier. I use this a lot for stars and pebbles and sand. Beneath that is the pixel spray. I use that for very, very fine sand or very, very fine little speckly details. And then we kind of start to get into some more specialty brushes here that don't get used all that often but I find them handy enough to where I want them to be easily accessible. We have Messy Dab AR, Messy Dab Impasto, and Stencil Flow Map Sponge. So Messy Dab is a glazing brush that has a nice messy dab. It's also a glazing brush, so we can kind of build it up like this. We can also use the merge mode. There's Messy Dab Impasto. This is basically the same brush, but it's going to build up Impasto in your stroke. You can kind of see that building up there. It's that nice paint texture. There is Stencil Flow Map Sponge. I'm going to do a test stroke, and you can see I get this nice spongy pattern. This is using both the paper texture and the flow map. So we could change the flow map to fine dots, and then you can see there's a more dotted pattern mixed in with the simulated wood grain. We could change the simulated wood grain to something else, let's say pebble board. Now if we make a mark, it looks like this. So we get a very nice combination of both the flow map and the paper grain together in the same brush. I'm going to go ahead and fill with a pattern now, and let's take a look at some of the essential blenders. Now, I have a lot of blenders here because you can get a lot of different looks out of the blenders. I don't use every single one of these in every single painting that I do, but there are a few that I use very often. Diffuse Blur is one of them. We've played around with Diffuse Blur a little bit earlier. We can use very, very light pressure to just kind of fuzz up our image, or we can use very heavy pressure to really mix it up. So I use this a lot just to kind of soften things and to blend paint. Next to that, we have Smooth Knife Blender. If you want that kind of painterly, oily look when you're mixing colors together and blending them up, this is a great brush for that. Next is Oily Blender. And oily gives you a nice oily look when you're blending. The paint kind of smudges around. It has a little bit of texture as well from the paper grain. So if we change the paper grain to something that looks more like a canvas, then we'll get more of a softer result when we're blending here. This is a very nice organic looking blender. Then we have coarse oily blender. We can give that a try and we can see that it's blending using the flow map right now as the dab stencil. So we'll change that to clouds. Now it looks something like that. So when I'm blending with this, I would just be using this maybe just to kind of pull off little streaks from something or you kind of mix the paint up in this way to kind of blend it together like so. So some blenders are going to mix the paint and some blenders are going to mix up the pixels. Let's try Just Add Water. Now Just Add Water is going to kind of average the two colors that you're painting over in a nice soft way. This works really well for blending out watercolor. And then we have Blur. And if we increase the opacity of the Blur Blender to 100% and we blur, then you can see I'm putting this area that I'm painting over out of focus. So this is a great way to add focal effects. Once you start to go beneath this first row, these are more specialty blenders that you can experiment with. I don't use these quite as often, but they do really come in handy. For example, here's Springy Blender. This is a particle blender, and if we use this, we can really pull these nice streaks through our paint like this and mix it up. Or we have the Greasy Blender here. This will give you that nice greasy look where it's going to kind of pull the paint a little bit, but not move it too much. And then in the very bottom row, these are all distortion brushes. These are not technically blenders but they can mix up paint in a very similar way. For example, Distorto, I could use this just to kind of swirl the paint up. So it is kind of blending it in a sense. 
or I could use bulge and bulge will push the pixels out to kind of inflate them. Pinch will pinch them in toward their center. I use pinch, bulge, and distorto a lot in my particular workflow to kind of correct little mistakes and tweak things. And then there's turbulence, hurricane, and thin distorto. These don't get used all that much, but turbulence can kind of mix things up like this. So I might use this occasionally for clouds and things like that. So those are the essential blenders. Let's move on to the next category here, which is palette knives. And you'll notice that these custom palettes are actually stacked kind of based on priority too. I tend to use the rendering brushes the most and then the blenders second to that. And then after that point, a lot of these are kind of specialty brushes that only get used sometimes. So here in the palette knives, smooth palette knife gets used a lot. We looked at this a little bit earlier. We can add paint. And then as we start to build up the strokes, it starts to run out of paint and then it becomes a blender. So this works really well for adding paint and blending at the same time. You can see that you can very easily build up this form here of this shape and create kind of a three-dimensional effect without having to switch between a brush that adds paint and a brush that blends. The rest of these are kind of specialty palette knives and they're becoming a little bit obsolete because they're getting replaced by the thick paint category here, which also contains some palette knives. I'm finding I use thick paint a lot because it's giving me a very specific kind of look. Broken paint is the thick paint brush that I use the most often. It gives me this nice broken paint look. You'll have to have a very specific paper selected here. So we'll go to simulated wood grain. We'll make sure the contrast and the scale are up. And now we get that nice paint break effect. You would use this on mountains or rocks or trees and things like that. I'm using very, very light pressure to get that texture. But this is also a flat palette knife, which means that I can change the angle of the brush. If I have a Wacom art pen that supports pen rotation, I can make a mark that's tall, or I can make a mark that's wide, or I can make something that's diagonal and everything in between. I do have some brushes in the palette knives category that can do that. For example, angled palette knife. You can control the angle of the brush, but it is a little bit jumpy when you rotate from horizontal to vertical. Not quite as bad if you use something like angle knife here in the thick paint. I can go from horizontal to vertical quite easily and it's a nice smooth transition between the two. Plus I get that nice paint texture when I'm painting. So for me, these thick paint brushes work a lot better for palette knives if you want that nice flat brush effect. If you don't like the thickness of the paint, you can always double click next to the layer and you can take the thickness all the way down and then it will just be a regular flat brush like anything else. But you might also appreciate the more rigid look of some of these older palette knives. So most of what's in these two categories are specialty brushes. I'll let you go ahead and experiment with these. I'm constantly adding new brushes to my workspace every month. So some of this stuff might change over time. There's also the oily category here. These are a lot of oily liquid drip brushes. We have oily bristle, which gives us a nice oily bristle look. We have oily dry bristles, which gives us yet another kind of look that's a bit more dry with more texture. We have oily pastel. I'm gonna go ahead and set this to a pastel type texture, which gives us this nice oily pastel look. So all of these brushes are using enhanced drip. This is a particular brush type that we'll be exploring a little bit more later, but they all kind of share this theme. And if I ever want to do a painting that looks a little more oily, then I know to look for these brushes here. Beneath that, we have the nature category. If I'm doing a landscape painting, sometimes these brushes will come in handy. We have a brush to put down little pebbles or brush to do a waterfall. Here's foliage chalk. We can use this with green to put in some nice foliage texture like this. But again, these are kind of specialty brushes that only get used on occasion. I'll also mention that some of these brushes are in my workspace for other people to use. So whether or not I use them all the time, they're here because I feel they might be helpful to others. Next is inking. Inking is just a bunch of different ink brushes. We have ink bristle. So if I wanted kind of a more bristly ink brush, then I have that. And this is very helpful if I'm drawing in a very specific style with ink brushes. And we have the jitter oils brush. And if we paint with that, you can see that the edge is just a little bit jittery and imperfect to help it look more organic. Normally I would use this at a pretty small scale like this. And it just looks a little more organic than the regular detail oils. Next to that is a jitter scratch board. That's just scratch board with a bit of jitter. So the edge isn't absolutely perfect. Then we have rough ink. That has jitter as well, but it's more smoothed out. So it just looks like a rough kind of blobby ink line. 
Again, it just looks more organic. So if I was doing comic art or cartoons, I'd probably want to use that to help my artwork look more traditional and less digital. And then we have variable ink. This is a particle brush. And if we move it around pretty erratically, then it moves around quite a bit on its own. And again, it just looks a little bit more random. And then we have halftone. Now halftone requires a very specific paper pattern. So if I scroll down here, I have my AR papers that I created. I'll select halftone small. And now when I paint, I'm getting that nice halftone pattern that you would see in old newspapers or comic books. And I can control the scale of that halftone pattern, like so. So these are all brushes that I would use if I were doing a very specific inking style. We have some specialty texture brushes beneath that. For example, there's Texture Airbrush. These brushes can use your texture. So right now the high tech texture is selected. And if I paint with that, I'm getting an airbrush. Let's try Dab Texture Airbrush now. This is an airbrush that is utilizing the paper grain. Right now it's that contrasty random cracks, but it's also using the flow map. So you can see I get that dotted pattern that I've selected here in addition to the contrasty random cracks which gives me kind of a broken mud effect. I really like the way that this looks. If I change the flow map to something else, let's say marbled, and I change the paper grain to something else, let's say cane, then you can see I get a completely different looking brush. I might even increase the scale of the cane here, and maybe we can see that a bit better. So these are all brushes that I would use to add layers of texture over objects in my painting. Next is effects, and there isn't really a whole lot that I would use here on a regular basis. These are really specialty brushes that can do a lot of different things. The ones that are black are implying that you should be painting with a dark canvas. So for example, I could fill my canvas with black. I'll select splatter glow, and I'll select a dark blue color and paint with that. And you can see how splatter glow works. We need a dark canvas in order to be able to see what we're doing. Just as well, I could choose glow fractal, and I could put in some of that and Glow Fractal is a really beautiful brush. We'll want to look in our flow maps here, and this brush is utilizing the flow map. So if we change the flow map to a different flow map, then we get a different pattern here with this brush. So we can get some really, really interesting looking results. This is a glow brush, so of course it builds up on itself and continues to get lighter and lighter. And then beneath that we have watercolor brushes. I don't do a whole lot of watercolor painting here in Corel Painter, but when I do, this is a simple set of brushes that I can get a lot done with. I won't go through all of these brushes here, but you can feel free to experiment with them. We'll be touching on watercolor painting a little bit later in this course, and at that point I'll show you what some of these brushes can do. And then beneath that we have liquid ink brushes. Again, these are kind of specialty brushes that I might use for specific purposes, but they don't get used all that often. So just to recap, the priority brushes are located up here near the top of all these brushes and within each palette they're usually located near the top up in the left. So as far as my essential brushes, I would say probably maybe half of what's in this palette here, and then maybe a third of what's in this palette here. So it's really just a handful of brushes that I use for nearly every painting that I create. Of course there are some paintings that require specialty brushes, in which case I'll use those. There are also my image shows brushes, which I'll use in some paintings. And there's lots of brushes in here, but again, there aren't really too many brushes that I use on a regular basis. The ones that I would use more commonly would be these texture brushes. And that's because these can add different layers of various textures to things, so that can really come in handy when you're working. Just as well, there are also a lot of particle brushes that I will use. If I'm doing a nature painting, I might use some of these particle brushes from the nature category. Then I could get bushes, for example or I could get grass blades, like so, or I could get leaves on a tree, like this. There are also particle brushes that have glow effects, particle brushes that I use for hair. Here's hair thick. I could use that to draw long flowing hair like this in a very realistic way. Or there's flow fur, if I wanted to make some fur like this. So that is a look at the brushes that I consider to be essential. In the meantime, we're gonna move on to some brush techniques that I think you'll find very useful for digital painting.